Hello, and welcome to Crave the Wave, Class 2 on Mechanical Waves and Sounds. This is for the 2022 to 2023 season. I'll be sharing my screen. My name is Russ Burleson, and uh, my email is provided below. Should you have any questions? Today, we'll start off by going over a really quick binder check. You should have been working on your binder since the last video. We'll also go over mechanical waves. We'll talk about sound waves. We'll talk about some potential homework you may want to try. So for your binders, everybody grab your binder. Get out your binder and see if you can find the follow. And I say it's, if it's under 10 seconds, it's okay. If it's under five seconds, that's optimal. Normally, when I have a class of, let's say, 10 students in it, I'll, I'll see who does it first. And then we'll, we'll keep track of the points. So find, find the following. Don't quote them from memory. Find them. Because this is more a question of if you can find it in your binder quickly. Find rule 2B. Find the phase velocity equation. In other words, I want a version that, that helps you solve for the velocity. I want a version that helps you solve for the wavelength. And I want a version that helps you solve for the frequency. Okay? I want you to find a diagram in there that shows graphically what the wavelength of a wave looks like. And see if you can find three separate electromagnetic spectrum diagrams. Again, my favorite thing to do for electromagnetic spectrum diagrams is to go to images.google.com, type in electromagnetic spectrum, and take the first 10 to 20 of unique versions of electromagnetic spectrum, print those off. You can usually fit either four to a page or two to a page. If you do that front and back, it actually doesn't take very many pages of your binder. And then you've got all the various electromagnetic spectrums that the event supervisor could come up with. So let's talk about what we talked about last time. What is a wave? A wave is propagating dynamic disturbance. Okay, it's a change from equi equilibrium. So you're talking about like if you've got an ocean wave, if the ocean's not flat, it has waves in it, okay? Somebody does a cannonball into a pool, they create these massive surface waves if they're big like me, okay? You can also create other types of waves. You can create sound waves, okay? Where I'm pushing matter like air matter together. And then that, that compression then travels. So I have the energy and it's traveling, okay? Normally, they're gonna be mechanical or electromagnetic waves, but they can also be gravitational, heat diffusion, plasma, and reaction diffusion waves. They can be periodic, which means that they're constant, okay? And, and, and we usually talk about the frequency in terms of hertz, and hertz is equal to one over a second. And so like if I was to play something at a constant tone, okay? like I was to press the keyboard on an organ and press one key and just leave it there. I'm, I'm sending out a one single frequency or a chord of frequencies, okay? However, uh, you know, you can also have singular uh, events like, like the cannonball example where I jumped in and there's a giant splash wave. And there may have been subsequent waves, but it's definitely not something that's periodic. Okay, if it's moving in one direction only, it's called a traveling wave. Okay, and that would be often like with sound or something like that. But if it bounces back, or sometimes I superimpose it with um, other energy coming from the other direction, and it appears to be stationary, it's called a standing wave. Okay, and like a traveling wave could be again like my sound going out there, whereas like a standing wave could be I get inside a cave and it's got resonant for particular frequencies, and I can find the exact right frequency where it just resonates. So let's talk about general wave features. Here's, the, here's, here's a, a diagram that I was talking about. You see where we have the wavelength here, we have the amplitude, which is from the equilibrium to the crest, okay? And you've got a trough, okay, that's going to be the minimum amount. 
Okay, this is obviously a periodic wave. We also see what the direction of motion is in this particular one. We also see the velocity equation where velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. There's one thing that you should have displayed prominently in your binder, aside from the rules, it's that equation. But you should also solve for frequency. And as we see, frequency here would be equal to velocity divided by wavelength. And wavelength would be equal to velocity divided by frequency. Okay. And the other thing that I would always like to recommend is that if you're not sure if you have the uh, equation correctly, always put your units in when you're doing your calculations on paper and see if everything cancels out and you get the units you're expecting. Usually if you get the units you're expecting, you're, you're more likely to be right. You definitely know you're wrong if you, if you get the units you're not expecting. So let's talk a little bit more about the velocity of a wave. You can not only say that the velocity is equal to the uh, wavelength times frequency, but you can also say it's equal to the wavelength divided by the period. So the period is the time it takes for an entire wave to go past. So it's one over the, uh, the, the frequency. So whereas frequency, its unit is hertz, which is equal to one over a second, period, its units are seconds. Okay, and when we talk about group velocity, we're going to talk about actually encapsulating or modulating um, a, and you'll have a carrier signal. Okay, so this is used in like frequency modulation, amplitude modulation. We're not going to get into the equations for that because that's beyond the scope of this event. So normally when somebody says, what's the speed of light? They're really asking you for the, for the phase velocity. So let's look at mechanical waves. And so here are mechanical waves are oscillations of some type of matter. So you're talking about water or sound that's in air, or we're talking about seismic where I've got actual earth moving, okay? It requires an elastic and inertia-based medium to propagate. In other words, it's gotta be something that actually can be deformed somewhat, okay? So like if you couldn't, if, if steel couldn't be deformed at all, okay, uh, when I hit one end of a, of, a, of a steel pipe, I wouldn't be able to hear it at the other end. Because again, that sound energy travels through that pipe. It also travels through the air, okay? And again, if we're in some place like the vacuum of space, I don't have a medium. There's nothing for it, uh, the energy, uh, the matter. There's nothing... There's no inner or matter for the energy to transfer. So therefore, that's why you can't hear sound in space. The different types here are transverse waves. And we see at the top here, we have a transverse string wave. And what you'll notice is that the energy displacement is perpendic perpendicular to the, the direction of travel, okay? Whereas longitudinal sound waves down below the, the molecules are pushed together in the same direction as wherever they're propagating. And then surface waves are between two surfaces. And it's where you have one material moving and it's actually the, the, uh, the interface that's moving. So now we're talking about ocean waves, we can talk about seismic waves, et cetera. So let's talk about transverse waves. Some of the more popular transverse waves are, of course, as you see, the string waves. Uh, sometimes they'll talk about like flipping a rope, and, and that's what they're talking about there. You also see at the bottom here, guitar string waves. So I strum the guitar, and the wave, the, the, the displacement is up and down, but the propagation of travel is along the string. Okay, so that would be a transverse wave. Also, all electromagnetic waves are transverse waves. And the reason for that is, is by definition, the motion of propagation is going to be in the direction that is both perpendicular to both the electromagnetic energy, which is shown here in, in red, and the magnetic energy, which is shown here in blue. Okay, and you'll notice that the as one's going this way, the other one's going in and out, and then the propagation's that way. 
And we'll talk about the right-hand rule for figuring out for electromagnetic waves, the propagation direction. So let's talk about surface waves. Okay, so surface waves, these are a mechanical wave that propagates along the interface between different media. So you're talking about ocean waves, you're talking about seismic waves like Rayleigh and Love waves. There are some electromagnetic waves which qualify as surface waves, okay? That's very advanced, but it's basically where the electromagnetic energy gets trapped near an interface and then follows that interface. And a good example of that is radio ground waves, okay? So now keep in mind, electromagnetic waves are surface waves in between two dielectrics or a dielectric and a conductor, okay? And again, at this point, we're talking about um, stuff that's right near the surface. You use it a lot in fiber optics. Um, you use it in radar for stealth technology, et cetera. Seismic rays, such as Rayleigh or Love waves, are also surface waves. And you'll see how, like Rayleigh waves, and you'll see that they're surface waves. They're also sort of transverse because the direction is, is from left to right but the Rayleigh wave actually goes up and down. But since it's at an interface, we call it a surface wave, okay? And then love waves, which are similar, actually are also transverse waves, but they're going side to side as they propagate, okay? Keep in mind, a surface wave is gonna be anytime you have two mediums and the wave traveling right there at the interface. So let's talk about seismic waves. We were just talking about those. So these, can't, are the things we feel as earthquakes often. But keep in mind, those are a little bit different. They're, they're different types of seismic waves. The first type are what we call body waves. These are ones that go through the earth, okay? And when you think about the body waves, I want you to think about P and S curves, okay? And you'll notice uh, down below here to the right, this is a P and S travel times uh, at, at a normal location. So. So P or primary or compression waves are very much like a sound wave traveling through the, the earth, okay? And they go about six kilometers per second. So that's actually really fast, okay? S waves are also called secondary or shear waves. They're much slower. They're side to side, okay? So they're not, so they're not compression type waves and they go about three and a half kilometers per second. Again, always go by the P and S curves if you provided them, but those are just general good rules of thumb, okay? The other type from body waves are surface waves. And these are actually ones which travel on the surface. These are much slower, but these are the ones we actually feel. These are not ones that's being measured by a seismograph. These are ones that we actually feel. These are ones that cause things to fall off your walls or, or buildings to collapse. And these are the actual earthquakes. So you'll notice here below is that this sort of shows you where the, what the P and the S waves look like as far as how they travel, okay? And so you'll notice that the direction of travel is from below the surface, which is where, where the actual location of the earthquake begins at, and then you'll notice how they travel up the P and the S waves, but they're, they're not the ones that are gonna destroy the house. The ones that are gonna destroy the house are these Love and Rayleigh waves. And you'll notice the Love waves are going back and forth, back and forth, and the Rayleigh waves are the ones that are going like this, like a giant ocean wave, uh, but now it's made out of earth, okay? So one thing to keep in mind is that when we think about when we feel an earthquake, we're talking about surface waves. And when we are talking about the other types, you know, the, the body waves, the P and the S waves, those are the ones we actually measure to figure out where the epicenter is at. The one thing that um, I would recommend though to keep in mind is that the ones that travel throughout the, the Earth's crust, the body waves, they're gonna be much faster. The, uh, the surface waves are much slower. So they're not gonna be even 3.5 kilometers per second. So what, so what we have is we have these devices called seismographs and they measure small movements. And then if you look at the difference between S and P, you can determine the distance to the epicenter. 
And then if I have three measuring state stations in three unique locations, and I got the three distances for the same event from those, uh, for, for those, uh, uh, if I had the distances, I can put them on a map. I can take my handy dandy compass with a pencil on it and I can draw the circles of those varying sizes. And wherever all three circles intersect, that's the epicenter of my earthquake. Okay. And so what you'll do here is that you will measure the distance between the S and the P waves. Okay. Then you'll look for that distance right here on this S and P wave um uh graph and wherever that distance in time is okay i then can read off what the distance in kilometers is so i look at delta t which is from which is from the p wave to the s wave okay i look i look at the distance in time i then go to my graph i look for where i'm going to have that same distance in time and that's how far my distance in kilometers is. So let's talk about that. So in this particular case, you'll notice that this one, we have 1.5 uh, minutes in between uh, the P and the S waves. So that tells us that's about 900 kilometers away from our Mexican uh, size, uh, um, seismograph. Then if I go to this one island, also in Mexico, but uh, you know, uh, really far away, I'll notice that it is now 1800 kilometers. So there's a bigger difference in the P and the S waves there. And so you'll notice I drew a red circle here for that one, I drew a blue circle. Now, when I just had two of them, the epicenter could have either been here or here because they intersect in two, in two places. So then I happen to have a seismograph in Pennsylvania. And it's saying, hey, that same event occurred and, it, and their delta T is five minutes. So that's equal to 3,300 kilometers. So I draw the circle there and guess what? It intersects here. So I know that that is the location of, my, of the epicenter of my earthquake. Okay. Now, there are, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Remember, shear waves go about three, three and a half kilometers per second. Compression waves go about six kilometers per second. So the distance in kilometers is approximately 8.4 times that delta T, approximately, okay? Um, now, what, what I will tell you is that always go by the curves, but this is a really good way to see whether or not your answer is in the ballpark. So let's talk about longitudinal waves. Okay, so the medium violates parallel to the direction of a wave, so like sound waves. Okay, sometimes uh, we'll we'll hear them called compression or pressure waves. Okay, sound waves are the most common ones. So we'll see here below, down here. So we have a speaker, and it's producing um, uh, at a at a singular hertz, and it appears to be at about one hertz. Okay, and then we see our sound waves going out. Now, of course, this is much, much slower than it does in real life because, you know, sound goes very, very fast. And you can see how the waves of energy are radiating back out. Okay, if I was to put it on a graph at a distance, you'll notice that the, at the top here, you see the longitudinal pressure waves. Another type is if you take a, like a spring or a slinky and you and you pop one side to the other, and you can see the energy going through, that's also a longitudinal wave. You also have seismic P waves. And, but one thing to keep in mind, all of these require a medium. So let's talk about sound. How fast does sound go? Well, it really depends on what your medium is, okay? And that medium is gonna have a lot of things that are gonna impact how fast it, it passes the sound. First off, if you have no medium, you have no sound propagation. You won't be able to hear anything. However, at 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, very close to room temperature, or you know, it's basically room temperature, the speed of sound in air is about 343 meters per second. Okay. I think that's something that should be in your binder. 
And that's also something that you should just have a general feel for that in air, it's about 340 meters per second. Now, things can change. The temperature can change. The pressure can change. The density can change. But generally speaking, we're talking 343 meters per second. Most of the time, that's going to be the speed of sound. Okay. And to give you an idea, uh, in miles per hour, that's 767 miles per hour. So it's still really fast. Okay. So, so the, the formula for speed of sound developed by Sir Isaac Newton and then improved by Mr. Laplace called the Newton Laplace equation is equal where C is the speed of sound. Okay. And it's equal to the square root of the elastic modulus divided by the pressure. Or the elastic modulus is also equal to the heat capacity or Laplace coefficient times the pressure divided by the density and take square root of it. Okay. Now, generally speaking, sometimes I might give you the elastic modulus of something and the pressure and then the density of something and say, what's the speed of sound? Okay, that's one way to do it. I could also give you any combination thereof. Okay, so in this particular case, I would not just have this formula here. I would also be able to solve for density. I would be able to solve for the elastic modulus, for the heat capacity ratio, and for the pressure. Okay, but let's talk about some of the general rules for the speed of sound. Okay, number one. Higher temperature generally increases speed, okay? So the hotter you make the material, the faster that wave's gonna go through. And there's a lot of different reasons for that, but it's just a general rule, okay? It's actually a bigger deal in air uh, than definitely pressure or density, and we'll get into that uh, later. Different materials have different speeds, but just generally, just generally, Speeds will be fastest in solids and slowest in gases, okay? And the reason why is that there's stiffer material in solids, which makes it easier for it to keep pushing forward that sound even faster. Now, the other thing that we'll talk about here is that you'll see here, this is what sound waves look as you, if you actually measured the, um, the pressure as a function of time. And then also, if you ever have anything go faster than the speed of sound in that, in that medium, like here we have an airplane that is going faster than the speed of sound in air at that altitude, you'll notice it creates a sonic boom. And it breaks what we call the sound barrier, okay? And so this would occur exactly at the speed of sound, or sometimes we refer to that as Mach 1. We'll get into that in more detail. Another way for calculating speed of sound, and this is the, these are some general formulas for dry air. If you're near that 20 degrees Celsius or that 273 or 293 Kelvin, if you're near that, you can use either one of these formulas to approximate the change in or the uh, actual speed of sound for air. Okay, and you'll notice here, uh, nu is the temperature in Celsius and T is the temperature in Kelvin. And the way you convert from, from, from Kelvin to degrees Celsius is you take the degrees Celsius, okay, and you add 273.15, okay? Zero degrees Kelvin, okay, uh, is absolute zero. It's the point at which there is no more energy, so you can't get any lower than that, okay? So Kelvin uh, has the same uh, graduations as Celsius, okay? But it just starts at absolute zero. It also makes it a lot easier for a lot of these equations. So a lot of times uh, we, will, we will work in Kelvin, okay? Whereas degrees Celsius, okay, Degrees Celsius, you know, uh, works really, really well around temperatures that humans are comfortable with. Okay, so you'll notice here is another set of equations, and these are just expansions on the equations that we saw. Okay, 
So you, we saw this one before where we have the uh, Laplace coefficient times the, the pressure divided by the density. We take the square root. Okay. Very similar to the one we saw before. We also then take that using the ideal gas equation, and I can use the molar uh, gas cost, the universal gas constant here, which is 8.134 joules divided by uh, Kelvin moles, okay, times T, which is the absolute temperature. It has to be in Kelvin, and we divide by the molar mass of the gas, okay? And as you can well imagine, this RT over M is equal to the pressure divided by the density. Okay. We can also, if we want to do, if we want to do something a little bit different, that also is equal to Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules over Kelvin times the temperature in Kelvin divided by the mass of a single molecule. So all of those should give you the same answer. Okay, and this is for any gas. Okay, so this is how they um, determine like the speed of sound and let's say argon or krypton or any type of gas that you may have there. Okay, so a couple things I want you to note from there. The speed of sound is going to be proportional to the square of the pressure. Okay, the absolute temperature and the adiabatic index. It's inversely proportional to density molar mass of the gas and mass of a single molecule, okay? And this is the, probably the big one for an ideal gas. And most gases can usually be considered ideal. The speed of sound depends upon temperature only. And the reason why is, is pressure, to, pressure and density in an ideal gas change in lockstep. So they sort of cancel out. If I double pressure, I'm going to double density in an ideal gas. If I half pressure, I'm going to half density in an ideal gas. So they cancel. So any changes in one cancels out the other. So if I'm looking like if I can turn up the pressure in an ideal gas, does it change the speed of sound? No. If I if I turn up the density, does it, does it do anything? No. If I change the temperature, yes. Okay. Now, what you'll notice here is that in air, you'll notice here at about, uh, you know, the speed of sound, and we have different temperatures here, okay? And you'll notice that most of them, uh, for, the, for the temperatures that we're going to be operating around, so normally it's about 20 degrees for us. Look, 343 meters per second. So this right here is the most most important one. You notice here's the density. Okay. And then this is the acoustic in, impedance. Okay. And so this sort of shows you how much impedance is given to the speed of sound. So as the temperature goes up, the speed of sound gets faster. As the temperature goes down, the speed of sound gets slower. Okay. And eventually it gets to zero. Sound doesn't propagate. Speed of sound goes to zero. So let's talk about if we were going to mess with altitude. Same rules apply. You'll notice this slide looks almost the same as some of our other slides. And the reason why is that none of the rules have changed. But as we notice here is that if I look at altitude on the left-hand side here, when I'm at zero, when I'm at sea level, okay, I see here is the pressure curve, and then here's the density curve. And you'll notice, again, they move in lockstep. So the changes in one cancel out with the changes in the other. So the only thing that changes with altitude that has any impact on the speed of sound is going to be the temperature. Okay? And the one thing that you'll notice is that if we're at the same temperature, which we are here at five, at five kilometers as we are in at 45 kilometers, okay, You'll notice that at five kilometers, da, 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 our, and 45 kilometers, our speed of sound is the same. So temperature really is the driving factor. So even though we're changing in altitude, you really have to look at the altitude versus temperature curve. And by the way, this is a good example, and it takes you all the way from the troposphere all the way up to the thermosphere. 
So generally speaking, you know, if you're at sea level and you're at 59 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 15 degrees Celsius, you're about 340 meters per second. Okay. If you get up to about uh, 20,000 meters, okay, which is about where, you know, most commercial jets will be flying, it's minus 57 degrees Celsius, minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's dropped all the way down to 295 meters per second the speed of sound. And then if we go up another almost 10,000 meters to 29,000 meters, this is the flight of X-43A, you'll notice that it got a little bit warmer. When it got a little bit warmer, the speed of sound also went up a little bit, okay? In solids, remember the speed of sound is gonna be a lot faster. Okay, so the speed of sound in solids can have different speeds depending on the deformation mode. Okay, so you're going to have the P and the S waves again. Okay, so you'll have the volumetric de deformations, the compression, and the shear deformations, the S waves. P waves are almost always going to be traveling faster in materials than shear waves. That's just a good general rule of thumb, and it's generally true in all solids. So the speed of sound for stiff materials, you can use Young's modulus and the density, and the ratio of that, you take square root of it, and you get the speed of sound in a solid. You can also use these other equations if you have the bulk modulus, if you've got the shear modulus, okay? And so you can see there's a lot of different ways of, of solving in for these. The one thing that I will tell you is that in these equations, V is Poisson's ratio, okay? have these tables in there, but also have the general tables in there for uh, your different materials. So like I, I, in the homework generator, I've got a sheet there and it's like, here's all the gases. And I just grabbed all the gases out of Wikipedia and the speeds of sound there. Here's all the liquids. Right? Here's all the speeds of sound, all the solids, okay? So you can see that hydrogen's got a much faster speed of sound than like air. Okay, and then you can compare water versus oil for figuring out where you know which one's got a faster speed of sound, and then and then none of that compares to like steel, which is like a lot faster. In liquids, there is no shear deformation, okay, because they don't hold a shape, okay, so there's only compression pressure waves. So think of these as like shock waves or sound waves. And the speed is usually going to depend on the pressure and depth and temperature and composition. So here's one of the things that when you talk uh, specifically about liquids, but also to a lesser degree about, about um, uh, gases, is that as you go higher or lower, you're actually going to have a different composition. Like seawater is completely different at the top than it would be all the way down at like 5.5 kilometers below sea level. And what you'll notice here is that the speed of sound, generally speaking, goes lower as we, as we go in depth. And that has everything to do with the temperature, has everything to do with the different salinity, and then it changes, and then the speed of sound continues to increase as we go, and the pressure becomes harder and harder, okay? And that sort of makes sense, because if you think about it, the top part, we have a bunch of change in the composition, and then after you get about a kilometer down, or 750 meters down, which is really far down, after that, you don't have as much composition change, you just have more pressure change. Okay, and what you'll notice here is that we're normally talking 1,520 meters per second. So like five times faster than uh, in air directly above it. And then, and, and it generally, and this is seawater, and it'll generally vary anywhere from 1480 to about 1550 uh, meters per second, okay? You'll also notice as the temperature changes, okay, the temperature is going to have a, more of an impact. So if we think about 
this being this being uh, what we like to affectionately refer to as um, as room temperature. So room temperature water, it's about 1480. Okay. If we get down to freezing water, okay, we're all the way down to 1400. Still much faster than air. But again, keep in mind that temperature and depth are usually the biggest indicators of the difference in temperature or in speed of sound in liquids. So what I'd like you to do is try to get all the various formulas for speeds of sound for gas, liquid, solid, and plasma. Find out what Mach number is. Write out an, an explanation that makes sense to you. Put that in your binder. Find the tables for density, the adiabatic index, uh, Laplace coefficient, bulk modulus, et cetera, so you can calculate the speed of sound. Put those where you can find them quickly. Also find a whole bunch of tables, but at least one with speeds of sound for general materials. Make it where you can easily find the information. And that'll be the, I'm gonna recommend to do that, uh, to do that binder check at the beginning of next class. So thank you for your time. I hope this was uh, useful to everybody. And uh, we'll, we'll start the next one talking about electromagnetic waves. Thank you.